He lives close to uptown, and um, of course, this has been a conversation in our family, um, uh, intense conversations that we've been having for the last several nights, and I wanted Hollis to sit in and see if we can um, just gain some perspective on how to talk to each other and to the rest of our family and friends. Thank you, Leslie. Can you call on someone? Oh, oh, um, go ahead, Linda. <laughs> or did you already talk, Linda? No, she didn't. Where is she? I can't. I'm find right her. here. Okay. Um, Linda. Yes, I there you go. I want to stay abreast of what the church is doing and, and what everybody is, is thinking about this. Um, you know, last week I spent a lot of moments in tears about it and for the first time spoke out on Facebook and I know that that's a safe place to speak out relatively speaking. I mean, I did get some backlash, but, um, you know, it's, it's time. Like Carolyn said, it's time. And I don't know if you meant this Linda or the other Linda, so sorry. <laughs> you can call down the other Linda now. The other Linda. The other Linda. Um, well, I'm here because I have of same okay. reasons. I'm, uh, we've been having a lot of discussion in our family and um, with my children who are, you know, ages where they can, you know, they're thinking about it, they're worried about it, they have opinions about it, and, um, and it's, it's affecting them in many ways. And so um, we, we wanted to be able to discuss it with people and, and just learn more and get perspective and um, share thoughts. You want Linda, to say share your, your last name, please? And uh, mine is Anello. Anello. Uh -huh. And your daughter? Um, she's Amelia, Amelia Stadler. Thank you. She's a little shy right now. <laughs> no. no, she's not really. Ken, <laughs> um, you want to introduce yourself and your wife? going to unmute. Ken. There we go. There we go. Yeah, well, Mindy's actually on the phone now, so she's, <laughs> she's taking, she took off there for a moment. So it's good for us to, to, to discuss, want us to discuss and, and, and then, you know, collectively, what do you think you know, we can do in a positive way as a church? So again, I, I mentioned that more than words. So what, what kind of actions can we do? Uh, and do those in positive kind of ways that builds relationships and builds bridges, and that's important. I think that's, that's part of who we are, and so how can we do that in an in effective kind of ways? Thank you. You want to tag the next person? Oh, let's go Bakers there. Bakers. You speaking or me? Speaking. I'll um, just wanted to be a part of the conversation. Um, I feel like we live in our safe little bubble here in 28270. And somebody said to me today, you know, what, what can I do as, you know, I, I don't know what I can do. And that's how I feel. I want to, I want to have an impact. And I feel like, yeah, I need to do something. Thanks. And that is, who's that next to you? <laughs> this is Marty, and, and uh, I'm here because I'm, I'm just incredibly sad, and I, and I just, uh, I, I know I lack perspective because I've been living in white privilege my entire being, whole life, surrounded by it. Um, so I'm, I'm just really sad and, and want to be in conversation, uh, and I like being next to Linda Linforce. Oh, <laughs> and I'm on my screen. I'm next to you, Lynn. Oh, well, good. And so, can you pick up on um, someone else who has not introduced themselves? Let's see. Uh, how about Bill and Debbie. Bill and Debbie, there they are. Well, I'm very similar to Marty. I, I, um, I just hurt from all of this, and it's just gone on way too long. Um, particularly, I mean. I mean, it's been over 400 years, if we're really honest with ourselves. And we are very privileged as whites. And um, I think a lot of times we just don't recognize that, or a lot of whites don't recognize that. And it's time that we as a country um, face it and quit sweeping it under the rug and 
and something needs to happen. I don't know that I have the answer. Um, I have some thoughts, but um, anything, Debbie? No, I just, you know, I know I'm white privileged and have been that my entire life. And um, it just is very disheartening and saddening to see these people that can't even be heard. And I just want to be more proactive. Thank you. Um, you want to call on next? Next person. Um, how about Barbara? Barbara. Okay, I'm sad about what's going on too, but I guess the main reason I'm here is I'm tired of the church, meaning Methodist church, not doing anything. So I want to see some action rather than a lot of talk. Thank you. Um, Margie. Margie. Hi, um, I'm Margie. Oh. There she is. Um, I'm here because I, I, I've been brought to tears several times this week. And um, I'm also in the unique position of having a um, son-in-law who's a federal park policeman who had bricks thrown at him last night and guns pulled on him and he he's just say it's been 11 straight days and he says this is wearing me down um it, it's just such a hard world because i understand the anger having been a teacher and seeing how my kids were treated by by us and by others and i really do want to be a part of some change and uh, I'll call on, I don't know, because I was late coming in. Who hasn't talked? Karen and Rick haven't talked. Karen and Rick. Okay. Yeah, they're there. Um, the main thing after we met with our Sunday school, it's like we have got to do something. The church has to do something. There's been protests before. It's, it's, it's not going to change until we change it at the booth, the voting. Um, we've been lucky enough to study this. Um, Terry and Dale have, Brooks have told us a lot of the history. We studied the um, um, New Jim Crow, uh, evicted. We've just, we've been studying it. It's horrific. I, I think it's time not to just wonder what I can do as a person. It's time that we collectively, uh, now that we know what we know, um, and that protests really fizzle out after a while. Um, I just think the church needs to really take a significant stand. So that's fine. And Rick? Uh, this is Rick. I'm frustrated and I'm angry. Um, no. You know, we've been dealing with this, that I've been dealing with this and praying for uh, social justice. It's been since 1968 when my hometown got, you know, got got burnt and the injustices that just happened during all that time leading up to that and the whole thing. And it's just sad. The what year? How many years is that ago? It's over 50 years ago. You know, and nothing has really changed. So, and can anything change? I'm not so sure. That's all. Um. Let's see if I can tell Ron Dean. I've not met you well, I don't think before. So I yes, couldn't figure out how to get my name on the screen there, but anyway, I am Ron. This, well, I, uh, I see Ronald Dean there on your screen. Oh, do you? Okay, okay, good. But I didn't do that intentionally. I don't know how I got. Uh, I, I was. Just, I'm here just to get other people's perspectives. I. I uh, it's a. Uh, seems to me a very, obviously deep rooted, uh, and difficult issue and I really haven't heard any solutions proposed that make any sense to me so I'm interested in hearing what other people's perspectives are or what 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 can you do to begin to make a change because it appears to me we've made little or none in over the many years thank you introduce your wife please oh, it's hi. my wife Ava hi how are you hi good hi. to see you why are you here? Why are you here? Just oh, I'm, <laughs> I just want, I'm just here listening. I, I'm a listener. I'm good. So. 
I think that's what most of us will be doing tonight. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, Bruce and Jane? Um, I was 17 years old during the Watts riots when I lived in LA and nothing has changed. Wow. And I just, I think like everybody, I just feel helpless doing anything on my own and I'm hoping as a community, maybe there's something we can do together to make a drop in the ocean. I don't know. Bruce? I, I, it's been mentioned, but I think because we all suffer from the great um, white privilege, um, we are the ones that are the reason that things haven't changed. Um, I mean, we see protests, like Jane said, in 68, although I was in Vietnam then, um, but again in 92 in LA and time after time in various parts of the country. Uh, this isn't the first senseless murder that's occurred, um, but time after time, nobody has been held accountable. Um, and I think a couple of things have to happen. One, we need to demand that change does happen. And we, I mean, the white privileged ones. And two, I think law enforcement, it isn't enough for them to do uh, a good job in trying to protect us by going after bad guys in the community. They can't be a good cop unless they go after bad guys in their ranks. And I think that's the other piece that has to be uh, an accountability piece that has been far too long missing. Um, and then juries and those kind of things. Uh, I look back to 92, the Rodney King. Rodney King and the thing that started those riots and the fact that they couldn't convict the law enforcement officers who just openly beat the shit out of them um, is mind boggling to me. But I've seen it happen time after time after time. And unless we as the privileged ones or the ones with perceived power don't hold people accountable, um, change isn't going to happen. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, Laura is joining us. Uh, can you speak now, Laura? Laura Morris? No. Yeah. Oh, good. I hope it's not noisy. Yeah, it's okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm, I'm here, um, and I'll be honest, because we haven't, like, been in church for so long, I've felt that I might be alone in this and it's actually reassuring to hear everybody's comments. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, I, I'm not done. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I agree with everybody. Um, my, and I, I don't, I'm emotional, I guess, cause I hadn't really talked to anybody about it, but I've taught so many wonderful kids and I'm scared for them because they're well educated, but because of the way they look, they could be racially profiled and harmed or killed and it breaks my heart. So I think I'm here to support them and to figure out a solution, but also because I think a lot of us need um, education. We need to learn from people of color, you know, what they've gone through and how, what are their options or what are their suggestions for what we can do. Um, and I think that's the, the big thing that I'm here for is to offer, oh, Koi, sorry, to offer um, up my suggestions and, and to listen also. Thanks, Laura. Teresa Himes is with us on, by phone, I think. Teresa, can you introduce yourself and share why you're here? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. This is Teresa Himes. Um, I'm here, um, I, I think this has been my sort of my day of learning. Um, the organization that I work for, our uh, CEO came out you know, with his own statement 
Um, I'm in healthcare, so you know we're here to take care of the community and within the organization. Um, we've, you know, already um, started having what we call those difficult conversations, trying to bring together diverse groups within the organization to um, be able to have conversations about race and about privilege and about, um, you know, racism, implicit bias, um, you know, whatever you want to call all of these things. And um, on top of that, I just happened as I was trying to wrap up work this afternoon, um, saw an alert that um, my Brothers Keeper Alliance was having a town hall meeting. So I listened to that for like about an hour and a half and it was very, very enlightening. Uh, a lot of uh, really wonderful um, activists and facilitators talking about um, race and, um, you know, the sort of the drivers that are, are behind, you know, the unrest, the civil unrest, but also just the, the chronic, um, our chronic inability to deal with those causes and create a more just society. And so I look at, you know, wrapping up the day with this group as um, just another opportunity to get another perspective. Um, because I, I agree with, you know, what everybody's has said, you know, action needs to be taken, but oftentimes it's baffling as to what action we should take or how we can can help. Um, so, I'm, you know, just feel like this is an opportunity to just listen and gain perspective on that. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Susan Smith. Hi, Linda. Hi, hi, Wayne. Hold on just a second. Susan? Well, I, I could just repeat what everybody has said here. I just feel incredibly frustrated. Uh, it just seems like most people um, are of same mind as us, when I, at least when I talk to people. And so it's just really frustrating when I see that things don't change. My, my vote isn't enough. Um, it, I feel helpless and it's very easy to watch the news and get really distressed about it and then turn off the news and very easily just slip back into my comfortable life and say, well, I just won't worry about it. It's not my problem. But I think that's what too many people have done. I think there are so many of us that if, if we would all get involved, we would actually make a change. But it is so easy to say, well, it, it doesn't really affect me. So I'm just, I'm going to stay out of it and I just really would like to do something this time around. Thanks Susan. Dan you want to check in? Um, hi I'm Dan Bader I'm the communication director uh, here at St. Stephen. Um, I'm really happy to be able to set this up for Linda and our new um, open door um, team at St. Stephen and um, I could just echo, you know, what, what you all feel. Um, powerless and hoping to do something, but not sure what it is. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Diane Back. Good, good evening. Good evening. Um, I think I agree with Dan. I, I really do feel powerless. Um, you know, I can do things in my classroom, but I don't know how far those things reach. And um, really looking for answers. I know we need a cultural change, a very deep cultural change. And how do we do it? Thank you. Um, Wayne Smith, and I think Beverly's there too. <clears throat> yes. The question is, why are you here? Introduce yourself and why are you here? I'm Wayne Smith. Uh, um, I'm just here to listen to hear other people's opinions. I mean, everything in the news is negative. It's a tragic situation. Uh, but then, like Susan was saying, when you go back day to day, a lot of things aren't as bad as the news makes them seem. But that's not the deep root of the problem. Is Beverly able to speak there? Oh. It's hard. Um, I'm kind of lost as to what to say. And feeling 
like I have never done enough um, to help the change. The things that come to mind, I honestly have avoided doing, which is moving out of my neighborhood and out of my comfort zone into a neighborhood where I would be in the minority and um, I haven't been willing to do that. I'm not sure if Wayne would go with me, but <laughs> um, I, I feel really bad about that. I feel like I could have been much more effective if I was willing to make that kind of change myself and I don't know how I can expect other people to change if I if more of us are not out trying to show that it has changed thanks Beverly uh, there's something identified as Shelly's iPhone enter and sign in please uh, yeah hi it, this is Shelly Williams um Shelly Williams hey, yeah I'm here, I, you know, obviously I'm very frustrated because I used to be a non-sworn um, member of Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department, and then my daughter's father is a, a police officer, so I used to always be, and not that I'm not pro-police, but, you know, I would always see their sides of things because, we went through similar training and, you know, I know like the thing that they drill in them is no matter what you come home safely at the end of the night. Um, but I know as I was working there that they, <coughs> excuse me, they um, did encourage officers to go to, you know, black communities to, um, you know, hit their ticket quota um, and, and to look for things to, to do because they had an activity log that they had to fill out. And so I have seen that side of it. Um, so it is, it's just very frustrating because, you know, obviously I'm not saying I'm, I'm anti-police, but I am disgusted by the behavior that not only Minneapolis has, has shown with what happened with George Floyd, but even like CMPD last night, you know, attacking innocent protesters unprovoked. Um, I know my daughter wants to attend a protest and her father's like, you shouldn't attend any of these, not because of the fear of riots, but because of what the police are going to do to peaceful protesters. Um, and that really doesn't settle very well with me. And so I just want to figure out a way that we can, you know, be more involved, whether it's you know, taking a look at like our local CMPD citizens review board, because otherwise, you know, everything just goes through internal affairs. And I think more things need to be looked at by citizens, you know, outside of the department. Um, and, you know, just ways that we can be involved as a church to, you know, try to combat the systemic racism, because I come from a small town and I've got family members that I'm ashamed of some of their viewpoints. And I mean, it's embarrassing to me. Thank you, Shelley. That's a, that's a good perspective. Um, terrific. Uh, we got three more people to introduce. Carol, and, uh, I'm sorry, Catherine Hummer. Mm. Catherine. She's, she's muted, Catherine. There you go. <laughs> yeah, I'm here because um, sad a little bit, but mostly just angry and frustrated, very, very angry. And, um, and it just, you know, how many times does this have to happen before there's some change? But I've, in, in the past few days, I've become so acutely aware of my white privilege in that I can turn off my media and it doesn't affect me. And I think about the change that I need to make personally, which is if, if my brothers and sisters who are people of color have to deal with this day in and day out, then I should be doing the same. Thank you, Catherine. 
appreciate that. Bill Cole, how is it at Altersgate? Um, haven't been able to get out in 83 days, so we're sort of stir crazy, but, but we're doing well. Um, I think you got your hair cut, Bill. Hmm. Yes. Well, you know, you notice. First time in three months. Uh, it took her 23 uh -huh. seconds. Uh, well, well, well. Uh, anyway, she couldn't do. I asked her, could she um, make me beautiful? And could she part the Red Sea? And could she make the sun uh, not rise? And she couldn't do but two of them. Anyway, anyway. Uh, I wrote in the midweek last night, many of you on the mailing list have to put everybody. I wrote about this um, as the aftermath of yesterday because more than any of you by far, my history goes back, civil rights, uh, family in Montgomery, in, in Alabama, in Mississippi, all the museums, the, the Lynching Museum uh, there, nearly 5,000 lynchings seeing this, the people so emotional looking at this black and white, uh, and reading about some of the things that we've seen on TV about, about people disliking the protest. That's the first thing, and I wrote about this again. Well, Martin Luther King sort of believed in him. He was my age. He lived to be 39 years old. Uh, all the protests, the march 50 miles to Montgomery, or the Birmingham, all of these things, and I guess I've fought discouragement uh, through the years, and yet, you know, there's hope when you look out and see all the good things. My, my thought about um, uh, all the, the, um, the police force, all of those who work in, in, uh, in, in that area, I've been amazed at how many students I've met, to my surprise on my train experiences, who uh, uh, are going in, into um, uh, criminal justice, which amazed me. And with the, I said, why would you want to do that? We've got some young ones in our church and the pain that they must experience in all this kind of, and what they have to do. So anyway, all these things weigh heavy on my mind, but I was captivated in some of these things this morning in the Observer, the, the, um, the uh, cartoon, if anybody sees it or looks at the Observer this morning, well, the picture by President in front of the Episcopal Church there with his Bible and he was standing in this cartoon bulletin board, church book blocking it out. Then he stepped away to leave and the bulletin board had these words on it. Jesus wept. That got me. That got me. Uh, just translating. You can have all kinds of opinions about uh, these things, but some just reach into your heart and wrench it out. I could go on, but I better stop before Randy calls me. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Bill. Um, Melissa and two children. Please. Um, I'll let them both uh, talk for a second too. I would just say there's four things we can do. Um, one, we can attend the uh, National Call for Moral Revival. It's by, um, it's the Poor People's Campaign is doing this on June 20th. I can send you more information. You can register and attend. It's online. It's a virtual uprising um, that was started well before uh, George Floyd and, and some of the others, but that is June 20th, Saturday, June 20th. Um, you can join the NAACP, it's $45. You can do that. You can show up at a protest and I would love to see our church put a Black Lives Matter sign out front. So I think we're here because we still have a lot to learn too, but um, we have a lot of friends and our son's closest and dearest friends um, are at our house all the time are like our sons and uh, it, it like Laura said it's 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 tough when I think of the conversations that I've had with Isaac and the conversations that they have to have with their kids and and when he's with them it, you know and they go out the door it's yeah, it's scary sometimes uh, for them. And um, 
yeah, we want to do better and we can do better. And I think there's a lot of things that we can do. And I think educating ourselves is a first step too. And there's great books. We've done some studies uh, <coughs> trouble I've seen um, by Drew Hart is an excellent book that we did together a few years ago, but um, there's just, there's no reason to be ignorant. There's too many uh, podcasts and TED talks and uh, books. And so him wise is another great person to um, I've not read any of his books, but anyway, I could go on and on and on. Um, there's tons of those resources in our resource center. Um, so yeah, I think there's plenty that we can do and plenty that we should do. And that this, my girls. Uh, I'm Sarah Kate, um, and I guess I'm here because I feel like it's important for the youth of America to also be involved in this because I'm still yet to grow up. Like, I am 16. I'm going to be around, I hope, for a lot longer. And when I'm here, I don't want to be ignorant. I don't want to ignore what's going on. I want face it head on before it gets any change. worse and because it's there's no change that's been done in the past there's still as bad as it was so I don't think that it should continue the way it is it needs to change um yeah. thank you that's good um I'm Victoria hi um <laughs> hi Victoria um, I, yeah, I guess I'm here too, just to kind of start this conversation that I definitely agree, like, needs to be had or said, and, um, I agree with everything that Sarah Kate has stated, and, um, yeah, I think it's really important that we all just, like, begin to educate ourselves, and, yeah, like, Melissa said, there's no reason to be ignorant anymore, like, there's no excuse. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, this is a thrill to see all of you. And actually, there's a couple people more that are not on this, may or may not be on your screen because we've expanded so much. So there's three more people that I know of that can introduce themselves and then I'll, then I'll uh, have a plan. I have a plan. Austin, why don't you introduce yourself and tell why you're here? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Austin Holland, Director of Youth Ministries uh, at St. Stephen, um, and I'm here because this is me. Um, this is my family. These are my people. Um, this is my cause. Um, has been my whole life. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I'm acutely aware of all of these instances. Um, I have been the recipient of the talk. I've given the talk. Um, I, I've been in the car when my dad has been stopped and I've, I've sat through the most uncomfortable four and a half minutes, um, you can experience. So, um, I, I'm here to, uh, because in the past week and a half, I've lost a lot of hope. Um, because I've lost friendships of 20 plus years and I'm a young person, so that's a lot. Um, and so uh, I just needed a little bit of hope. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Lanston's are here with us. Charles? Charles, if you can unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm un yeah I've been able to do that finally with my technological skill. But yeah, Tim and I are here. And, I, I also, and also James is here too. Um, and I would, uh, I'd say I'm here for a number of reasons. One is, uh, from a personal perspective, as some of you may know, I grew up in Memphis as a child in the 60s, uh, and it was even clear to me as a child that things were not quite the way things should be. We'd, uh, you know, we'd have uh, an African-American lady sometimes babysit us at night. We'd take her home to her neighborhood, which wasn't far from ours, and just the difference in the neighborhood as a child, I didn't understand why why is it so different, right? Why is it, then that's just not fair. Um, secondly, I'm here because, you know, I continue to have blindness and uh, ignorance despite some attempt at 
understanding and enlightenment. I was talking to a colleague of the day in the office who happens to be an African-American lady. And I said, you know, you know, Gail, you know, at least I know this. I know that if I go into a store or a restaurant and your husband goes in the store or the restaurant as well, I'll be treated differently because of the difference in our skin color. Um, I'm also here because uh, I'm concerned about our country and our 400 years of inability to address this issue that still lingers. Uh, and I'm here also is just to see how we as a congregation could um, become more enlightened, become more understanding uh, to do justice. And Tammy and I have been talking about that last couple of days. You know, one idea we had, and we've talked about it, trying to reach out to more diverse neighborhoods within around the church. Secondly, we thought about teaming up with the African American um, congregation, <clears throat> like for example, St. Mark's over on Clanton Road uh, is, is a good thought. But those are just kind of why I'm here. Tammy, you want to say anything? Um, well, I have a lot of, um, well, I worked in construction for 22 years, so I, I was the minority being a, a female, and, um, but, you know, when you work with people of color for that long, they just become your friends, sort of like a family, so, um, it's just kind of sad to think that they're not as accepted as other people. And Sarah and James are quite interested in, um, they went with Austin and Laura the other day to a protest. And um, I think James has some words that he'd like to share. Great. All right. Okay. Uh, so I'm here because recently I've become well aware that I am a very privileged white guy who has had the, like, I've been blessed to be able to go to a, a majority white school and just avoid all this problems my entire life. And I've realized that I need to use that privilege to do stuff that I wouldn't normally do. And recently I've been trying to reach out to a couple of guys in my school and I've got a lot of mixed reactions. So that's why I'm here. Thanks, James. Thank you. Uh, there's one person that I'm not able to see, and that's Hannah Newman. Are you there? Hey, Linda. It's actually Leslie. I'm on Hannah's laptop. Oh, okay. <laughs> Leslie's here. <laughs> it's a nice picture of, of Hannah there. Yeah, I was actually eating dinner, and y'all didn't need to watch me do that. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm here. Um, like a lot of people have said, I'm sad, I'm frustrated, I feel helpless, um, but I've had conversations this week with um, folks on my team who are people of color, and some of the stories they've shared with me are heart-wrenching, um, and I just know as, as, a, as a person, um, and as a congregation that we have to do better. Um, and I know I have a lot to learn. I mean, I, I grew up like many of us in a small Southern town and I, I don't have a lot of experience with um, some of what our, our brothers and sisters have, have dealt with. Um, so it's, there's a lot for me to learn. I'm doing this. I'm, there's a couple of podcasts that I've downloaded to start to listen to and need to get on Amazon and, and order some books. But um, this is part of, of me beginning that learning. So I'm glad that we're doing this and thank you for facilitating. Thank you, Leslie. Um, like you, I felt a lot of the same emotions. Uh, I really feel that that was an important exercise to do. We are all feeling that um, anxiety and that pain and recognize that part of it, this is not going to change until we as white people do something, not stand by and say, this is terrible, but to actually do something. I don't know. I don't have a magic pill of what to do, 
but I'd like to harness some of the energy we have here to stay in the moment of feeling this way and recognize this is just a drop in the bucket to, to what um, people of color are experiencing, many people of color are experiencing in America. Um, I think it'd be helpful to use the chat function liberally. If you have a question, if you have some resources, type them in the chat and I think we can uh, uh, save that. Is that right, Dan? Okay, we can save that chat. So that can be a resource. So as we're talking just a little more tonight, start writing down some things you found helpful. Uh, I know this week I came across um, a report that was issued uh, as to how to uh, focus on local police efforts at becoming better at addressing folks uh, in a dignified and respectful manner and, and avoiding some of the problems uh, that happen with, them, with the discrimination. That's a resource I can put up there. I'll, I'll assemble that for us. Um, so use, please use the chat function tonight. Uh, everybody's not gonna be able to talk, um, but I do think it will be helpful for us to look at the social principles of the United Methodist Church because they say something that you may not ever have heard um, said in a church. It's a, um, it's really, really helpful when you can um, look at the founding documents. Now, I think most of you know what, um, what this is, what the, um, I'm trying to exit my full screen here. Okay. Um, what the social principles are, but just for a refresher for anybody that doesn't know, the social principles are brought up every four years to the general conference. No one can speak for the uh, United Methodist Church except for the uh, documents that are approved at general conference. These are the um, social principles that, uh, that were issued in 2016. There is a newer edition, but I don't think we need to worry about that right now. It hasn't been passed, obviously, since General Conference got um, postponed. I think this says enough, and I think it's a, it will be a good uh, grounding in what the United Methodist Church has said we believe. Um, so uh, raise your hand if you've read it. Some of you have got it in it early. If you don't have it, go ahead and write down in the chat that you don't have it and I'll get it to you. I think this is really, really helpful in um, just uh, having a base to start on. Let's see where the United Methodist Church has said is is. Um, if it's all right with you, I will read the first paragraph and then we'll take comments. If there's something that we haven't said so far, if there's something that puzzles you or something that um, is something you disagree with or strongly agree with, uh, uh, let's hear it. So if that's okay with you, I don't hear any, if there's any, any objection, you have to hold your hand up or something. Here's the first paragraph. The rights and privileges the society bestows upon or withholds from those who comprise it indicate the relative esteem in which that society holds particular persons and groups of persons. We, meaning the United Methodist Church, we affirm all persons as equally valuable in the sight of God. We therefore work towards societies in which each person's value is recognized maintained and strengthened. We support the basic rights of all persons to equal access to housing, education, communication, employment, medical care, legal redress for grievances and physical protection. We deplore acts of hate or violence against groups or persons based on race, color, national origin, ethnicity, age, gender, disability, status, economic condition, sexual orientation, gender identity, or religious affiliation. Our respect for the inherent dignity of all persons leads us to call for the recognition, protection, and implementation of the principles of the 
Universal Declaration of Human Rights so that communities and individuals may claim and enjoy their universal, indivisible, and inalienable rights. Who knew that the United Methodist Church said something like that? Was that a surprise to anybody? Raise your hand. No, okay. Well, I had a little beef with that paragraph where it says, okay. Um, we support basic rights of all persons to equal access to medical care. Do we do that? I mean, have we recognized that every single person needs to have e e equal access to medical care? You've seen in the COVID crisis that it's affected um, people of color disproportionately. So there's something wrong and amiss with um, at least in America, with following this um, this ideal and aspirational goal. Any remarks on that? We'll go to section two, or, or paragraph two. Rights of racial and ethnic persons. Racism is the combination of the power to dominate by one race over other races and a value system that assumes that the dominant race is innately superior to the others. Racism includes both personal and institutional racism. Personal racism is manifest through the individual expressions, attitudes, and or behaviors that accept the assumptions of the racist value system and that maintain the benefits of this system. Institutional racism is the established social pressure pattern that supports implicitly or explicitly the racist value system. Racism manifested as sin plagues and hinders our relationship with Christ inasmuch as it is antithetical to the gospel itself. In many cultures, white persons are granted unearned privileges and benefits that are denied to persons of color. We oppose the creation of a racial hierarchy in any culture. Racism breeds racial discrimination. We define racial discrimination as the disparate treatment and lack of full access and equity in resources, opportunities, and participation in the church and in society based on race and ethnicity. We are calling on society to be changed as well as the church. Um, I heard some people talk about white privilege and recognizing white privilege. I think that's the huge uh, change that has been brought about in the last two or three years is a recognition among white people that we have that privilege. Um, and everybody on the call most would probably see that but there's so much of uh, white society that does not see that. And addressing that is probably more our job than the job of people with color. We, we've, we have gone so long, I think um, some of you made reference to the fact that we've gone on so long in this struggle um, and we've been bystanders. And it's gonna take us being involved as white people and following the lead of our brothers and sisters. If you want to say anything, hold your hand up. I can talk even more. Here we go. Yes, it's uh, Charles, go ahead. Yeah, Linda, I hope you can hear me now. I had a couple of thoughts based on uh, your reading and your commentary. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, white privilege was de jure uh, in our neck of the woods. Uh, since the founding of the uh, of civilization here in terms of Europeans in North Carolina. So I kind of have a hard time of white folks not recognizing, uh, recognizing that uh, even today, although it's more kind of a de, de facto as opposed to de jure in some ways. Uh, and I have had a couple of discussions with uh, Bill Cole on this topic because again, Bill's got a lot of wisdom and has been around longer than I, but I was always I've always been interested uh, in folks um, to the extent that, you know, uh, given that each person uh, is, a, is a child of God and is seen equally by God, 
why didn't good God-fearing white folks in the South stand up and say, you know, uh, in the old days, certain things were absolutely wrong, and, and for the most part, they didn't. So there's always been that rub between what the gospel calls us to do and what our society or our socialization causes us to do. Yeah. Yeah. What um, can, uh, can somebody tell me an example of white privilege? I have one. Okay, Margie. Um, my parents were college educated and my mother, though we didn't have much money, my mother helped me go to college and helped me pay for it. Um, working with my students in AVID, they came from backgrounds where no one in their family had ever heard of that. And just being, having the language to know how to navigate a college application form mm -hmm. is a privilege. We don't, we just automatically assumed that that, that everybody has that and they don't. Who else has an example of white privilege? Yes, Terry. Almost all white people inherit some money from their family. Almost all black people inherit debts from their family. Uh, they struggle to pay for funerals. They struggle to pay for loans that were incurred by their family. Uh, the wealth distribution in this country has been against them ever since slavery. We did all kinds of things to help white people. GI Bill to go to college, uh, housing loans that were only for white people, neighborhoods that were only for white people. Uh, most of our wealth is, for most of us, is in our home, and most black people were not able to take advantage of that. Most black people were not. Correct. Right. Yeah. Another example. Oh. I think that's important. It's important to recognize these. Karen. Um, this is kind of a off a, a little bit, but how about the privilege of not having uh, in 1964 been uh, not given proper treatment for syphilis and being and dying uh, to see if the treatment was effective. The Tuskegee Horrible. Horrible. Right. Yeah. 1964. Yeah. Barbara. Uh, to go with what Karen just said, I've got a current day 2020 example. All right, there were all these testing sites. I saw them here in South Charlotte. And then suddenly somebody had an aha moment. Maybe we should put a testing site on Beatty's Ford Road. It was the, the black people were thought of after the fact. And yet they're so vulnerable. So here, the testing sites went up in the white neighborhoods or white parts of the city. So continue that, if you will, um, in the chat, if you can put down an example. My example is that uh, being able to isolate, self-isolate is, is more white privilege. You have to be privileged to be able to isolate. Uh, continuing on, let's see. Mm -hmm. Bill? One of the issues is the housing isolation here in Charlotte. And Monday night jumped out of me because those first riots were on Beatty's Ford Road. And I became aware very quickly, we have students who go to Northwest School of Arts. It was right in front of that. And we're Charlotte, where two of my kids get. These are the neighborhoods that struggle. The, the looted store, was a food line store right there. It's different to get food stores into minimal neighborhoods and those because they don't make money. That's one of the problems that the, that's a struggle for so many who are the, the marginalized folks here. So the fact that that was on Baysford Road and if one of your kids went to Northwest School, would that have any indirect effect just for their safety, just for their safety because of, of, of the whole uh, sociology of it. 
So in the chat, uh, Linda Curtis added that with remote learning during COVID, many minorities don't have access to computers and, in, and internet. Also, also, there was a um, comment by Leslie Newnham that said that one of her team goes by a nickname, so she sounds white. She has to hide who her identity is. So that's, that's uh, some of the things that are going on in chat. I'll continue reading. Therefore, we recognize racism as a sin and affirm the ultimate and temporal worth of all persons here and in the beyond. We rejoice in the gifts that particular ethnic histories and cultures bring to our total life. We commit as the church to move beyond symbolic expressions and representative models that do not challenge unjust systems of power and access. I wanna read that sentence again, because I think that's so important. We commit as the church to move beyond symbolic rep expressions and representative models that do not challenge unjust systems of power and access. I think many of you made reference to that when you said why you were here, saying it's gone on too long there's, there's something at the root of this we need to pull out that, that goes to challenging unjust systems, which is not an easy thing to do. We commend and encourage the self-awareness of all racial and ethnic groups and oppressed people that leads them to demand their just and equal rights as members of society and people within the society. I'm sorry, members of society. We assert the obligation of society and people within the society to implement compensatory programs that redress longstanding systemic social deprivation of racial and ethnic persons. We further assert the right of historically underrepresented racial and ethnic persons to equal and equitable opportunities in employment and promotion, to education and training of the highest quality, to non-discrimination in voting, access to public accommodations, housing purchase or rental, to credit, financial loans, venture capital and insurance policies, to positions of leadership and power in all elements of our life together, and to full participation in the church and society. We support affirmative action as one method of addressing the inequalities and discriminatory practices within the church and society. Some of you know I participated with the Justice and Reconciliation Commission of the Western North Carolina on Saturday with a service of lament. We, they are right now uh, behind a movement to have equitable salaries for uh, our, uh, our clergy of color and uh, female clergy. Their uh, fight has been long and hard and they are not there yet. I was amazed to learn that one of the um, black clergy appointed from Western North Carolina is on food stamps. Now, we, that's not a way to support our clergy. And there's something wrong in the church that we're not being equitable about this. We want diversity, but we have to have diversity with equity. So that, piece about um, it's the obligation of society and people within the society. I would say that the church has an obligation to look to its own, uh, what do you call it, the stick in your eye, back uh, Jesus parallel, remove the stick in your own eye before you um, say that somebody else has a problem with their eyesight. So um, the, the work of the Justice and Reconciliation Movement within the Western North Carolina Conference is focused on that. Uh, I see a lot of stuff in the, in the chat that's uh, going to be really useful to read. There's been some um, um, talk of uh, books and uh, challenges and uh, videos and that kind of stuff. Um, I, I didn't promise you we would solve anything, but what I'd like to hear is, um, what do you want to do about it? Here you are, 
there's the what's the church stance everybody has to answer that for themselves and to be accountable to others i i uh don't mind uh, at all leading this but i think each person has to answer where they're going to go and how we can help you maybe you have a passion for being like shelly was talking about in the system that talks about the police accountability um there are ways to to go after that and i and i'll put some stuff in the chat or an email i will send you all an email that so that we can get keep in touch um but the question of what are we going to do about it what can we to do about it together um i see um recommendations for banners in front of the church that's always fun that's always good take because nobody knows what we stand for unless we tell them. Bill, you've got your hand up. Yeah, Linda, several people have mentioned books. Uh, Laura mentioned a couple. Uh, I think Austin miss, mentioned that Austin Chain Brown book, which we're looking at the Resource Center. If any of you have a book that has been meaningful or challenging or special to you, if you would just send me an email, we can order and we want to put together in one place, we talked about this before Charles and Pam and I and others and, and Kelly, about getting a lot of these together, put them in, in a clearly visible place, maybe even Sunday mornings in the North X, where these kinds of books where you read it and they grab you. And let me mention too, I had never heard of the Green Books until two years ago when that movie came out. Some of you have the Green Books. I grew up, I had never heard of it living in a completely segregated uh, Mississippi. The Green Books were published uh, annually from the 30s to the 60s. They were known by all of the African-American people in the South. It was their secret book to where you can go and where you are accepted and not accepted. In Charlotte, it listed four places in the 40s that if you were traveling, if you were well off enough. And this was an amazing underground kind of books that were circulated, we had never heard of them, didn't know they existed, weren't supposed to, like the Underground Railroad. So some of these things can really be awakening uh, media in books and resources and others that some of you are, are very familiar. So bottom line, just send me an email of what they are and we'll do our best. Or if you have one you'd want to contribute, we want to make some special features, uh, both in the Resource Center and in other places around the church. And uh, we do need somebody to volunteer to amass some of those books to, to have a list out so we can pass that out. Ron, did I see your hand up over there? It, it did. I, I, I'm troubled at, uh, you know, with, with the ideas. Uh, I, I think about the, uh, I'm, I'm retired, but when my employment, my civic clubs, my community, and my church, the most segregated place is the church. I don't, I don't know if we have a single minority member in church. If, they, if we do, I haven't met them. Uh, and it seems to me that a lot of the problem has to be in communication. And if you don't know people and communicate one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not sure how we get through some of this. So that, that, that's very troubling to me that uh, we, we can talk about a lot of education and a lot of different things, but we're all white. And uh, Char Charles made a comment, I think, earlier about maybe uh, doing something with a, with a more, with a black church. I, I think something along those lines might be something that really could change, start to change the system if we would break down that barrier. Yeah, Ken and I have talked at one point before the uh, uh, shutdown about having a, a, a altar exchange and a choir exchange with St. Mark's and I talked with the pastor there and he's interested in it. Obviously in this situation it's it's um, where most of us aren't going to church. It's a little bit more difficult but um, yeah that's uh, that's something to, to get together with our Methodist brothers and sisters of color and ask what they would like to do. What can we do to support them? Barbara you had your hand up. Um, at one point in time, we had another congregation that used the chapel. I don't know if they used any other rooms. 
So it would be, and they weren't United Methodists. I don't think that's an important part of it. Um, if we could invite a congregation who do, that doesn't have a have a facility, like is done at St. John's United Methodist, and that would be a good example. Um, also, I don't think we should just look at at black people, black congregations. I think that I mean that's the emphasis right now, but I think we should also look at other people of color. Thank you, Barbara. Diane, you were nodding your head. Diane, back. She's turning off her mute. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, the congregation that worshiped with us was a Latino congregation, and they used our chapel on Sunday night and one other night of the week, I think. And it was great to walk by and hear them singing and so forth. But I want to say, um, the expressions class has an African American member in our class, so we're we're excited when she can worship with us. Great, thank you, Diane. Karen, uh, I I do not want us to make the mistake um, of not doing the work and the hard work of what has been done to African Americans, uh, especially and for us. Like I think there was a mixed message. I think James said. You know, hey, we, we love you. We, we can't believe this happened. And we have to do more than that. We can't invite a congregation over without doing the work that uh, Christina Cleveland told us about at January Adventures. It's, it's uh, I, I don't want us to miss that part. I did type something about that in the chat. We, there is a, a process that we can develop, or I think it's already being done, something we can access to really do the hard work uh, that is just starting with some of us. Um, I, I'm not sure if that makes any sense, but it certainly made sense to me when I heard about it two years ago. So that, one of the uh, things that I did, uh, I ran across several years ago was a challenge to white folks to name, name all the black authors that you know, and I did not have many like less than five. Uh, I started reading books by black authors and that was very helpful. I saw in the chat, somebody recommended Color and Character, the story of West Charlotte um, High School. That was marvelous to understand what was going on at, in Charlotte this time. Laura. Um, I wanna echo what Karen said. Um, I think us making sure before we do invite um, African Americans into our congregation that we do the hard work and so my suggestion is or my I guess what I'm trying to say is this is more of like a marathon and not a sprint we want to take our time and really figure out how what is like the best way of communicating what we can learn um, books that we can read and and then maybe we can do something like that but I don't want to harm or to traumatize um, any people of color that we could, I mean, cause we, we are gonna make tons of mistakes in the beginnings of our learning. And I would hate for that to cause harm to people um, of color in that instance. So I think just taking our time and, and like Karen said, do the work and um, reading and studying learning from people of color, reading books from people of color. I think that would, that's a, a good start. Good, Shane. Um, kind of along the lines, I think I sent you something I read recently and it was just so simple. Yeah, um, I've got it here somewhere, here it is. Well, inclu included in the email, but what spoke to me was name the three tenants of Black Lives Matter. I don't know them. We spelled all of this. Um, Name one instance when you were exposed to an, a black person being ridiculed or dismissed and you spoke up. Just things like that that really got me thinking. So if you wanna include that in the email, it may help other people. Good, thank you, I will. Um, it's just occurring to me right now. Uh, so this could be a bad idea or the Lord's will, I don't know. Um, this is too big a group to have these kinds of discussions to really work. What do you think about 
um, five in one group, five in another group, two, to, do, to tackle one area. So if maybe we identify uh, seven areas. Uh, one, one group is going to study white fragility. One group's going to study something. Uh, one's, you know, each group, we identify areas people want to go in and then break off into uh, smaller groups to tackle those things. I'll look for your feedback on that. I'll send you all an email and reply all. And I am not at all invested in that. Just it seems like an idea because there's so much work. But I agree with Laura. I think as Laura and Karen have made good points, we need to make sure we're talking the talk correctly, getting down and um, getting into our uh, base and making sure that it's not just something we're going to sprint at and it's going to be the marathon that we want it to be. Uh, I have a prayer to close and uh, I so appreciate all of you. Yeah, and let me say before you do, Linda, real quick. Yes, please. One of my uh, clergy black, curly, clergy colleagues, African American clergy colleague, I was interested in, to hear what he had to say and um, what he said was, as far as how do we begin to affect change, he was talking about it's, it starts with relationships. It is building relationships with, you know, that's what's pulling that helps to pull us out of the, that bubble. Um, that's where we gain. I think we part of how we gain perspective, um, you know, it's doing the hard work of, you know, reading and, and those kinds of things. But also it's to me, it is that building those, building those relationships with, uh, with those that are different from us. Then in this case, you know, people of color, and how we go about doing that and intentionally do that. And that is, takes time. That is, uh, you know, that is the, the marathon. That's not the quick fix, but is once you, you I think you, you start, one of the places you start is, is in building those, in building those relationships. Because I think I, I'm a great example. You know, it, we're in bubbles. Or many of us are, yeah. myself included, are in, in these bubbles. And so those opportunities to even do that, you know, I have to push myself out of that uh, in order for that to, uh, to be, because it's so easy to just kind of to sit in the bubble. Mm -hmm. So how do we, you know, that needs to be a piece of the piece of this is, you know, um, pushing ourselves out of that and building those, building those re relationships. I think that's very, very true. Good. Thank you, Ken. I appreciate Please. that. Um, uh, I put in Mecklenburg Ministries. Uh, it's a good way to also be involved with the churches and, and nice people. Um, then you can hear from a lot of different folks. Uh, here's the prayer that I uh, extracted and changed just a little bit for our purpose tonight. Hear our cries as we agonize over the harm done to the family of God and to our brothers and sisters. Breathe wisdom into our prayers. Soothe restless hearts with hope. Steady shaken spirits with faith. Show us the way to justice and wholeness, enlightened by truth and enfolded in your mercy. Holy Spirit, comforter of hearts, heal your people's wounds and transform our brokenness. Grant us courage and wisdom humility and grace so that we may act with justice and find peace together as your children. We pray the Holy Spirit to move among us. Amen. I will talk to you on email. Be sure to talk back. Bye everyone. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Have a good hour. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Is someone going to um, make a list of all the, the resources that people put in the group chat? We haven't had a volunteer yet, but I don't know who was talking. So I captured um, everything that people put in the chat, and I'll email it to Linda to parse through as you like. And um, this is the first time we've recorded one of these, so we'll see what the recording looks like to share with members who couldn't be here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and I also took screenshots so we'd know who was here just in case it falls off. So we know how to reach you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye, everyone. Blessings.
There we are. <laughs> yeah, Austin, I think you got to end it for all, but. Okay, so.